But rather, we're going to study the subject with the foundation and with the framework in our heart that we want to know this because we want to be ready at the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not many months ago, we studied the teaching of the end times. We call it eschatology. We learn about the rapture, the tribulation, and many things, the coming millennium, and all that. But what's the point of knowing all this, gathering so much information, and yet we are not living a life that is ready at the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? I'm not here to give information alone, but rather as we learn and as we became informed, that information needs to lead to transformation of our lives. Because there's no reason that you became intellectual without knowing what is happening in terms of the biblical prophecy. Why is this important to us? And I want to begin in reading the book of Psalms, chapter 122 in New Living Translation. Beginning in verse 1, and I will be reading up to verse 9. A song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem, a psalm of David. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And now here we are, standing inside your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a well-built city. Its seamless walls cannot be breached. All the tribes of Israel, the Lord's people, make their pilgrimage here. They come to give thanks to the name of the Lord as the law requires of Israel. Here, stand the thrones where judgment is given, the thrones of the dynasty of David. Here comes our four verses to consider carefully. Pray. Can you say pray? Pray for peace in Jerusalem. May all who love the city prosper. O Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls and prosperity in your palaces. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, may you have peace. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek what is best for you, O Jerusalem. In these nine verses of the book of Psalm, chapter 122, the last four verses speak so profoundly, so clearly, and so seriously that each one of us, as believers of Christ, we need to pray for the city of Jerusalem. We need to pray for the, for the nation of Israel. We need to pray for the people of God, the Jew. Because in line of what's happening in Israel, we need to take seriously. Can you say seriously? I want all of us, including me, whether you are a Christian or not, whether it's your first time to hear a message like this, I want you to take seriously what's happening around us. I want you to take seriously that the words of the psalmist in the text that we have just read, particularly on verse 6 to 9, praying for Israel. Declaring the peace in that city, in that land. Because you know what? I want you to listen carefully. That is the only city where it is mentioned again and again in the Bible that the Lord our God will come back and reign in that city. Maybe right now there are many nations who doesn't consider Jerusalem as the city capital of Israel until President Trump did that. He is the first one to do that. But I'm telling you, in the coming of the Lord, it is not only going to be the capital city of Israel, but it will be the capital city of the entire world when the Lord comes. In that message, as Christians, we need to pray for the peace in Jerusalem and the whole nation of Israel. And I want you to take note. Very recently, as many of you are testifying as a church, we studied and learned about this message of the end times. For those of you who doesn't know, we are in the end times. In the Bible's timing, in the Bible's chronological order, we are in the end times. And we need to be serious about this. And through the teachings of the end times, we realize in that many subjects that we did in three months, 
we realize that every prophecy in the Bible revolves a lot around the nation and the people, the Jew, particularly in the city of Jerusalem. And most of the time, it will focus so much on that city. That's why when the psalmist said we need to pray for the peace in Jerusalem, he is not saying that just for the sake of saying but he is saying it out of the commandment of God. Transitioning to this message, I'm sure many of you are now aware of what's taking place in the Middle East region. Particularly in the nation of Israel, it's all over the news. Most of us, we are shocked during our camp Sunday service, looking at what's happening through the social media, YouTube and all that. The attacks across Israel last weekend was considered one of the most violent attacks since the Holocaust after many decades ago. And I found out, even research carefully, the sequence of events that happened. As we heard, who is the culprit? It is Hamas. Hamas is a militant group. Some of them considered Hamas as terrorist group. It controls the Gaza Strip, launch a series of rockets, it strikes and hit major cities across Israel. We watch it many times. It sent waves of fighters across the border in the southern Israel, via land, via air, and even on the sea. And that's why some of them even land using paraglider, where they, where they took over bases and seas captured many hostages. Whether they are killed, they are kids, young, as infant, elderly, soldiers. At around 6.35 a.m., the first siren warned of incoming rocket. As we all know, Israel have this wonderful, they call it, dome that protects them from all these airstrikes. And it's highly technological and advanced. This is the start of Hamas firing what will be thousands of rockets at Israel, striking, striking even the major city, Tel Aviv, and it doesn't happen. Some made the statement that there are at least 4,000 rockets were fired, fired to Israel. And then at around 7 a.m., the Israel Defense Forces confirmed that it is Hamas fighters have crossed the Gaza into the southern Israel they penetrate the border. They destroy the gate. And, and the Israel authorities ask residents of this town, mainly farmers, no ability to fight back, to hide in their homes. And most of the houses in Israel, they have this safety room. But that safety room became useless and futile because what they did, the barbaric action of this terrorist group, they burned the whole house. In 11.35 a.m., Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu of Israel makes his first statement to the nation on the crisis telling all the Israelites and telling the whole world, Israel is at war. Israel says it has begun its war against Hamas and they start firing back to the Gaza Strip. I want you to understand why we need to pay attention to this. The day that it happened is a very significant day for them because they are celebrating Yom Kippur, which is a highly regarded holiday in Israel. What amazingly happened here is Israel normally is always alert and heightened in terms of their defense because of all the dangers surrounding them, but this time, they were caught by surprise. Totally. No one is guarding the wall or the gate. When the Prime Minister of Israel declares, we are at war, I want you to pay attention, and I hope you who are watching and those of you who are looking after the children keep listening as much as you can. Because, whether you are a believer in Christ or not, the declaration of this Prime Minister of Israel must serve as a big warning 
like a blazing warning for all of us here in New Zealand when there is an ambulance, when there is a fire truck, when there is a police blaring their sirens, we can hear and we can see. And what do we do? We go on the side and make way because we can see the warning. Church, this warning is far greater. This war, according to the Prime Minister, said this war will be difficult and this war will take time. It's not going to be a blink of an eye kind of conflict. So the big question for us today is this. For us who are living here in New Zealand, who are so far away, for me who is young, that doesn't care about anything, for me that is busy in my work and in my business, for me that I am busy living in the good place of New Zealand, what does this mean to me? What does this mean to you? Maybe you are oblivious about all these things that are happening. How do we make sense of this situation? Does this conflict in Israel affect me? And to be honest with you, the truth of the matter is this. For many of us, we know nothing about how significant this conflict in Israel and in the Middle East is all about. Some of us can even care less. Some of us cannot be bothered even looking on the news, listening. You will still continue to your routine as if nothing major is happening. But I want you to see maybe you have this heart. As long as the rockets and all this fighting are far away from me, I cannot care less. I don't care about this. But please, remember our text. If we can go back once again to Psalm 122, chapter, chapter 122, verse 6 to 9, listen carefully again. Pay attention to verse 8 and 9, but I want to read in verse 6 again. Pray for peace in Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. O Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls and prosperity in your palaces. For the sake of of my family and friends, I will say, may you have peace. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek what is best for you, O Jerusalem. According to our text, we are totally connected to this city and to this land. Did you hear me? Say amen. That's why we cannot just ignore it. You cannot just close your eyes and be oblivious about this. We need to remember that as Christians, we are allies of Israel. We have physical and spiritual responsibility to the chosen people of God and to the chosen nation of God. Right? And there are many things that we don't understand here. At this very moment, there is great commotion happening if your spirit is awakened. There is a great deal of wondering, so many questions, and even some are so concerned about this recent war in Israel. There are so many questions arising, especially in the Christian dome. Watch in YouTube and, and type what's happening in Israel. There are questions whether this, is, this latest war in Israel is the beginning of the end. There are many conflict triggers. Will this, this conflict, is this conflict be the reason for the Israel and all this conquering nation to sign a peace treaty that will be what? Spearheaded by the Antichrist, just like what we have learned? Is this the war mentioned by Prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 38 and 39 called the war named Gog and Magog? Is this the war that will be taking place prior to the rapture of the saints? We don't know. That's why I want to set this straight. I'm not here to put fear in your heart. I'm not here for us to be dogmatic that you will go out of this place. Oh, Pastor Romel said, this is the war of Gog and Magog. No, I'm not saying that. I just want you to wake up. I just want you to be aware. Because the question is this. As a spirit-filled believer, I believe we are. Brother Archie encourages us about who and what the Holy Spirit is. 
as a spirit-filled believer, the big question to us is, how should we respond to this event? How are we going to answer this many question that is going around us? And I want you to realize, first thing, to answer this question, first thing, we should never approach this event with fear. Hindi tayo matatakot. We are not scared of what's happening. We should never, number two, speculate that this is what it's all about. This is this and then gave your opinion. No, be careful. We are not here to speculate. We are not here to be dogmatic because remember, only God knows when will this happen. But God, in the Bible, say in the Bible, not according to pastor, in the Bible, gave us so many signs. And whenever you see the sign, it means you are getting closer to your destination. Amen? We can never be dogmatic. The right response, the responsible response, the spirit-filled response is this. What does the Bible say about this event? And when you see what the Bible say, then we need to obey the Bible. That's why tonight we will search the scripture and ask, what did God said about all of this? Are you ready? Say amen. Don't sleep. Do you hear me? The message is about wake up and you are sleeping. Don't sleep. You need to wake up. Because look at Matthew 24, verse 6 to 8, the word of Jesus. Look, how are we going to respond to this? And you will hear of wars and threats of wars. It means rumors of wars. But look at what it says. But don't panic. Don't panic. It means, yes, wars are happening. There is war in Ukraine. And now there is war in, in Israel. But God said, don't panic. Why? Yes, these things must take place. But the end won't follow immediately. Can you say immediately? It simply means, yes, there is war. And there may be more wars. There may be more rumors of wars, but don't panic. But have an open eyes. Have an open spirit. Don't just ignore all this. But you should never panic because it needs to happen. As a spirit-filled believer, look at verse 7. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this, can you say all this? All this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. These are just the beginning and there are more to come, God said. As a spirit-filled believer of Jesus Christ, the Bible commands us never panic no matter how difficult or how how. How out of order the circumstances may be. Pastor, how can you say, don't panic? I'm panicking. I have loved ones that are not yet saved. That's why we need to tell the gospel to them. We cannot wait any longer. But I want you to, to, to understand this. Look at me carefully. Listen carefully. Don't miss this. If you truly are born again, believing, spirit-filled Christian, the reason why you will not panic is not from you. It's not from the news. It's not from your resources. The reason why you will never panic is this. Because if you truly receive, receive the Lord Jesus, you have that sense of security. And the Bible says, it will give you peace that surpasses all understanding. Why? Because even if this body is destroyed, remember, we will be resurrected and we will be transformed to our eternal body. Remember that. Matthew 10.28 said, Do not be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. But rather what? But rather fear 
only God who can destroy both your soul and body. Look at the emphasis. Where? Not in war. Not in any circumstance. God is saying, fear the God who can destroy both your body and soul in one place. And what is that? In hell. In hell. God is more concerned. I'm not saying that God is not concerned about what's happening, but God is more concerned about your eternal state. And that is in hell. And God doesn't want you to be there. So according to Jesus, yes, wars and rumors of wars come. And it will increase. Now, the war in Israel is here. Slowly, slowly, the war in Ukraine are being forgotten. But remember, war is still happening. But it doesn't mean that a certain prophetic event is going to take place immediately. That's why I want you to have clear understanding. It simply means that the war and the rumors of war is one of the many signs. Can you say many signs? It is one of the many signs. It's not the only sign, but one of the many signs. Signs of what, Pastor? Signs that was revealed in the Bible. That's why if you don't know your Bible, you will have fear that you should never experience. You would have worries and all that. But if you know your Bible, you will understand that these wars and maybe more rumors of wars, it is not the only sign, but rather one of the many signs given by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Himself. And what does this serve us? Remember when we are traveling and we will go to our destination, you will see a signpost. For example, when you are going to Cavite, Welcome to the city of Cavite. It means what? You are about to enter the destination. I like what, what one man of God used as an analogy. It doesn't mean that the certain prophecy will take place immediately, but rather all these wars and rumors of wars will serve like an alarm clock to us. Raise your hand if you use alarm clock. I use alarm clock. Many of you do, do and use alarm clock, right? Why do you set your alarm clock? Because you know you don't want to be wait in your appointment. Whether that is your work, whether that is your meeting, whether that is your school. And some of you, you even do five settings of alarm clock. Because when you don't wait for the first one, wake up for the first one, you will do the second. I'm telling you now. With the signpost of God, it doesn't work like that. Because alarm clock serves as a warning for us. Warning of what? That you need to wake up because you need to be on time to your appointment. You need to be ready. The wars, understand this, and the rumors of wars, including what's happening in Israel, in Ukraine, and then the very recent declaration that we heard from the Prime Minister of Israel, I want you to understand it's not the end. But rather, it is a signpost telling us how close we are to the end. Do you hear me? It's not the end. Because there are many things that will happen. But we are so close to that end. And one man of God said, imagine if all this timeline in the prophecy in the book of Revelation, in the book of Daniel, in the book of Ezekiel, what if it happens in our lifetime? The big question is this, church. Are you listening? Say amen. Are we ready to meet our Lord Jesus Christ? You ask that to yourself. Don't just listen to me. Ask that to yourself. Please, pay attention. Am I ready to meet my God? Is there still sin in your life that you haven't surrendered to Jesus? It means you are not yet ready. Is there still doubt and unbelief that you cannot give and surrender your life to Jesus? Then you are not ready. Because the big question to all of us, if we are seeing all these signposts that we are nearing the end, are we ready to meet our Savior? 
there are prophetic signs telling us that something far greater in our lives is coming very soon. Just watch what's happening in America. Just watch. Do you know, because of this study, we learned this. The river you prayed will dry. Why? You learned this. So that the army from the north can pass through that. Google it when you go home. How dry the river you prayed is right now. There are three rivers. The river of the Nile, the Tigris River, and the river you prayed. And the Bible is so accurate, church. That's why if you still doubt the Bible, it is so accurate. You know what river is drying? The river you prayed. That's why this, this event, it should be an alarm clock to all of us. Maybe the blare of the alarm clock is so loud and yet you are still sleeping. You still want to stay with your offense. You still want to stay with all your worldly things. God said, no one can separate us from His love. No one can snatch us from His hand. Do you know who's the only one that can do that? Yourself. Myself. Why? Because God will not make that choice for you. Children, your parents cannot make your choice for you to be serious with God. I cannot make choice for Sister Beck, the only one that will determine our standing with God is none other than you. And God is giving us all the opportunity to be in the right standing with God. That's why I want you to understand this. This increase of wars and rumors of wars are the alarm clock, but they are not yet the appointment. Do you know what I see there, church? Open your eyes. I can see the grace and the love of God. Say amen. That God is opening my eyes. I'm talking about my personal walk. Because I teach the end time. I know the prophecy. Not everything. I'm not an expert. But at least I understand what it means to know the time frame of God's plan in the end times. When God is allowing me and maybe allowing you by His grace to see the alarm clock that He is setting before you. You know what I see there? God, you're so loving. You're so gracious. You don't want me to remain sleeping. You don't want me to remain in my sin, to remain in my, in my laziness, to remain in my worldly desires, to remain in my offense, to remain in anything that is apart from you. God wants me to be awake, to be revived, to be ready at His coming. That's what God wants for all of us. That's why God is so good. When the Prime Minister of Israel declared war, I want you to understand, just going back a little bit in the subject of the end time, is this the war that we learn and that we're talking about many months ago? few months ago, in the book of Ezekiel? Is this the one being mentioned in chapter 38 and 39 that is called Gog and Magog? I want you to just read a little bit about that. Go to verse 2 of chapter 38, and then I will go to verse 3. These two texts, just, just pay attention that everything that is taking place can be the ones that the book of Ezekiel is saying. Can you go to New King James Version, please? Son of man, this is Ezekiel. Set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Chubal, and prophesy against him. And say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Chubal. Do you know what's amazing about this? Gog is a man and Magog is a place or a land. But there are two wars described in the Bible as Gog and Magog. One 
is very close now before the rapture or maybe just after the rapture. The second is in the millennial. Right? We learned that at the coming of our Lord. But I want you to see this. Do you know the word Rosh? That nation now? That is Russia. That is Russia. And it was described as the nation at the extreme north of Israel. You go to the world map, you know what's at the very extreme north? Yung pinakalas na nation at the northern part of Israel? It is Russia. And right now, we don't have any idea how Russia can be involved in all this. That's why we cannot be dogmatic and say that this is the prophecy that the prophet Ezekiel is saying. But listen to me carefully. There are three nations mentioned there, Rosh, Meshach, and Chubal. Do you know that three nations? Russia, Iran, and Turkey. Russia, Iran, and Turkey are the three nations that are supporting Hamas, training them, providing ammunition. And unfortunately, this America, the administration of President Biden, turn around the sanction that President Trump signed to freeze the money that was supposed to be given to Iran. And they turned that sanction and they signed and released the money and they gave $6 billion to Iran. And as soon as they received the money, the money is supposed to be what? For in infrastructure, hospital, school, and all that. As soon as they received the money, they have money to fund this Hamas. And what happened now? They strike. So, not being dogmatic church, it is such easy coincidence. But why is this taking place? Can you still call it coincidence? Or really? Can you say really? Or really? Is this the Gog and Magog that we are talking about in the book of Ezekiel? Just ask yourself. Just ask. I'm not saying it is, but I'm not saying it is not. There is a possibility. So just in case it is, do you know that in the timing that we have learned, this battle, the first Gog and Magog, will happen just prior the rapture or just after the rapture? And no one in this room can say when the rapture will take place. Are you getting this, church? Can you see the seriousness? That's why if you are not ready, God is waking us up. We can no longer take God lightly. Run away from everything that stops you from being close to God. Because it can happen before the rapture. It can happen prior the tribulation. It can happen after the rapture, before the tribulation. And there is no clear indication now. Please don't misquote me, okay? I'm not saying that Russia is involved in what's happening in, in Israel now. But who among us know that for sure? We don't know. We don't know many things. But one thing I know, I need to see what the Bible said. And I'm sharing to you the truth of the Bible. Are you following me? Say amen. Now, what do we need to truly take out of this event? Pastor, ano ba talaga ang kailangan ko malaman? What is the most important thing for me as a young man, as a young woman, as a mother, as a father, as a simple man here in New Zealand, or maybe those who are watching in the Philippines, in Canada, wherever you may be, what do I need to take from this? Okay? I will just give you Two words. Two words. Wake up. Wake up. Can you say wake up? I'm not talking about just physical waking up. I'm talking about your spiritual waking up. Because Romans chapter 13, verse 11, in New King James Version says, and do this, knowing the time. Do you know the time, church? We are in the end times. That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. It is time for us to wake up, Apostle Paul said. 
It is not the first time that he mentioned this message about waking up. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14, the same message that he gave to the church in Ephesus. To the believers in this church, he called them, wake up, you sleeper. And maybe that's the same for us. Therefore, he says, awake, you sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you life. Do you know what's astonishing in this text? Do you see the word dead? Pastor, how come they said sleep and then there is dead? Look at me here. Anyone who doesn't surrender their life to Jesus Christ in the sight of God, they are still dead. They are dead in their spirit and they are destined to hell. That's why we need to wake up. One thing is for sure. One thing. Maybe you are not sure about the message right now. Maybe there are so many questions in your life right now, and I cannot fault you with that. Maybe you are still in the lineage of doubting Thomas that you want to see first before you believe. Maybe. But I want you to understand, faith always precedes seeing. In our walk with God, seeing is not the first thing that needs to happen. Faith first. Maniwala at manampalataya ka before your eyes will be open. Because just you, you will remain blind. And you know who will open our eyes? That's the Holy Spirit that will open our eyes. One thing is for sure. And I'm very sure about this because this is not from me. This is from the Word of God. Hebrews 9.28 Jesus is coming again. Say amen. Say amen. Be sure of that. Jesus is coming again. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for Him, I want you to hear this. And rejoice and be glad. He will appear a second time apart from sin, but rather for salvation. Say hallelujah! We will see our Savior once again. And we are very close to that time. And I want you to understand this. That's why being ready, being awake, being, being in, in expectation, with an expectant heart that the Lord is coming. Look at me now. God is not concerned about your yesterday. God is not concerned even the time before you come here, whatever you have done. God is always concerned about your now. Your now. Your present time. Because God cares for you. He will appear a second time. The Bible never gave us a specific date. He never gave us time on when the Lord Jesus will return. But the Bible again and again, again and again, gave us so many signs. And what will take place of that last days? prior his return. I will share to you one sign. I learned after the pandemic, many people call it post-pandemic. And I thank God in this church we have recovered. That's why we are full now, but we are not satisfied. I've learned that post-pandemic, after the pandemic, 45% of believers, particularly in America, in the Western world, they no longer come to church anymore. They are satisfied to just watch on the video. The video will never replace the fellowshipping of the saints. Say amen. We provide that video only for those who are sick, but not for the lazy who doesn't want to come because they don't want to be disturbed. The video is only provided for those who don't have access because of whatever reason. But we don't condone laziness. 45%. And you know what the Bible says? Apostasy. There will be great apostasy before the coming of the Lord. And people right now are turning their back to our Lord and Savior Jesus. That's why when He comes, ano ang dadat na ng Panginoon? The Bible says, I will return to what? To the remnant church. It's not about the big church. We pray and we ask God that there will be many big church that will be ready. But you know what we know? The remnant church are the ones who are ready. 
they are anticipating the return of the Lord. The Bible is teaching us all these signs. Church, can you say the word tragedy? It is a tragedy for us in this church that we learn and study and I spent almost four months teaching the end times. We were so informed. The video is still available in YouTube about these end times. And yet we are not living prepared, being ready in the coming of the Lord. It is a tragedy for well-informed Christians and yet they are not living ready in the last days. It will be a tragedy in the life of every believer if he cannot discern the sign of the coming of the Lord Jesus. Yet, he keeps on receiving and receiving all these information. Alam nyo, pag ganun tayo, we are like the ones whom the Lord rebuked, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the book of Matthew chapter 16, verse 3. Nirebuke sila ng Panginoon. Alam nyo kung bakit? Why they are rebuked? You can tell the sign of the weather, whether it's raining or not, yet you cannot tell the sign of the coming of God. Look at what it says. In the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites. The Lord called them hypocrites. You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the sign of the time. Say amen, church. That's why God loves us. God doesn't want us to be hypocrites. God wants us to be ready. So in the light of all the signs around us, that our Savior is coming very soon, and we are encouraged to wake up and to be ready. That's why I will close this message doing one thing. Later on, normally I will ask you to stand up and we will pray, but today I will not do that. I want all of us to individually, without shame, without being pushed, without even being hesitant, I'm going to ask you in our closing to come in this altar and we will com- confess our faith in Jesus because I want you to know that the only way for us to be ready for the coming of the Lord is you, by faith, surrender your life to Jesus. And I will do that. And I will have this privilege to lead you in praying and confessing that faith. But don't hesitate to come forward. I don't care whether you are a sinner just now and you just realize just now that you are a sinner. I love for you to come here in front. Amen? Because that's the only way for us to be ready. Matthew 24, verse 44. Again, Encouragement for us to be ready. Therefore, you also be ready. How many times have we been hearing, be ready, be ready, be ready in this message? Be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Whether or not it will happen in our lifetime, whether it will happen in our lifetime or not, for our own benefit, By the grace of God, we are encouraged to be ready, to be ready, and to be ready. And someone said so powerfully, and I want you to write this down. I want you to write this down. Don't forget this. Because in order to be ready, Brother EJ, we need to do something. Amen? We need to do something in order to be ready. And someone said so powerfully, a passive, lazy believer is not likely to be a ready believer. There is no passive and lazy believer that will be ready. A passive and lazy believer is not likely to be a ready believer. A ready believer are those who are awake. Be ready for what? If we are ready, you know what? When we are ready, we are not just ready waiting and looking at the sky. That's not the ready believer. But rather what? Brother Chris is ready to testify the goodness of God. Brother Haji, just like what he did, not only testifying in this pulpit, but in his workplace, his mouth is ready in season and out of season to to testify that Jesus Christ is coming soon. And you need to be saved. Every one of us are doing the work of an evangelist. 
inviting everyone, not only Sister Teth, taking bloods, inviting believers, inviting unbelievers. Every single one of us are doing our part because we are ready for the coming of the Lord. We want our God to find us busy doing the work of the evangelists. That's what being ready, church. This is a very important state of readiness. You are not passive. You are not lazy. You are not lethargic. You are not, you are not just doing nothing. Your eyes are open. Whom can I share? Whom can I invite? Whom can I bring? How can I serve my brother and my sister? How can I serve the kingdom of God? I want to be ready because in the kingdom of heaven, I will be the servant of the living God. That's why in this earth, this is our practice. This is our practice. Our lifetime in heaven is a life of service. That's why 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince. If needed, you rebuke out of love. Exhort with all long suffering and teaching. We are so ready to boast about our living God. We are ready to be a blessing. We are ready even to pay the price of being a disciple. So how can I be ready like this, Pastor? This is my first time to hear this. Maybe for all of you, you know how to be ready. But for me, it is my first time to be in this church. How can I be ready? First and foremost, surrender your life to Jesus. No other name in heaven but the name of Jesus Christ that will bring you salvation. Every name of this earth, no name can save you. Only one name in heaven, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Seek the fullness of the Holy Spirit, just like what Brother Archie encouraged us. When you gave your life to Jesus, automatically you are entitled to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's why there is no lose-lose situation when it comes to giving your life to Jesus. And then after that, as our MC encourages us, join the body of Christ in prayer meeting, in Bible study. Turn your back from your sinful life. Be part of the church. Be one in the body of Christ. If you are offended and not serving the church, come back. Serve God. Turn your back from that offense. You have no time for that anymore. I want to be found serving my living God. And I am ready to meet my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? So the ultimate readiness for all of us is being saved, being born again, being willful to serve and to do whatever for the body of Christ. But sadly, church, and I'm closing in this, this message, we can have three reactions to this invitation. It's either you reject it, totally don't want to do anything about this message. Number two, you hear. But number two, you neglect. I hear it. Maybe I believe you, Pastor Romel. Maybe there are some evidence or truth in what you're saying. But I will just neglect that. But I hear you. But the third reaction is the perfect and best reaction that you can do. Accept the message. Embrace the message. Take ownership of the message. You are now informed. And since you are now informed, you are now on your way for your transformation. You are informed to be transformed because we are in the last day. Amen? Did you get this, church? Be ready for our Lord is coming. Hallelujah. Come on, let us all stand up. Music team, come forward, please. You know, I asked our worship team to prepare a song. 
And this song is all about declaring, it is well with my soul. Because church, I want you to hear this. No matter what happened to us, if we are ready to meet our God, our Savior Jesus Christ, we can worship from our heart. No matter what comes, Lord. No matter what happened, Lord. Whether I am here in New Zealand or not, no matter how difficult the circumstances may be, I can confess it is well with my soul. You need to declare this by faith. It is well with your soul. And there is no way that you can worship and declare this word, it is well with my soul, unless you receive Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen? That's why as we are standing up, I want you to bow down. Just pray. And if it is you that God convicted so strongly, maybe you've been in this church for many years, but you are just attendee, but you haven't truly received the Lord Jesus. Maybe it is your first time. Maybe you are still playing around with sin in your life. Maybe you are just moving in the motion of religion. Church, I will not allow this day to pass without inviting you to come to the altar of God with humility in our hearts and come forward and say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Don't watch whether there is someone coming or not. If that is you, I'm inviting you with all my heart. Come forward now, and then we will worship, and we will declare, it is well with my soul. Come on, come forward. Come forward. Don't be shy. We need to be ready. We need to be ready. Come now. You are not receiving religion. You are receiving salvation in Christ Jesus. Do not harden your heart. Do not harden your heart. When God is inviting us to be ready, this is our time to be ready. Hallelujah. Keep coming. Keep coming. Oh God, I want to be ready when you come. As a church, we want to be ready when you come. We should never be surprised. We should never be God. For you have given us so many signs in the Bible that you are coming. Hallelujah. Oh God, just, just pray. Just pray, church. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Jesus. Do not harden your heart. Oh God, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, God. Church, let us receive the Lord. Lift up your hands to God with all your hearts. From your heart, I'm not forcing you, but from your heart. Declare these words. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for giving your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and pay all the penalties of my sins. And right now, in front of these people, I am not ashamed to confess to declare and even lift my hands as a gesture of my humility that you Jesus you are my Savior you are my God you are my Redeemer I believe that you died on the cross because of me you were buried but on the third day 
you rose again. You are alive, Jesus. Holy Spirit, I receive you with all my heart. I open my life to you. Take over this life. Lead me every day. Help me to see the life that I need to live. Jesus, I declare my faith. I belong to your kingdom. And one day, I will see you. And I will serve you face to face. Jesus, I will never be ashamed to declare your words, to declare your message, for I am ready at your coming. This I pray. This I confess. This I believe in the mighty name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, I receive your anointing. I receive your power. I receive your discernment. I receive all the gifts that belongs to me. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Father, as we prayed, as we declare our allegiance to you, renew our mind, our spirit, our soul in how we walk in times like this. In these last days, that our priority is, is, is in alignment with your priority. That our plan is in alignment with your plan. God, we are no longer in control. Jesus, you are in control. Holy Spirit, we make room and we make way for you. We give you praise, O oh God. We give you thanks. This we declare in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone say, Amen and Amen. Come on, go back to your seats and we will worship. And this worship will serve as our prayer. Let us all stand up. Before we go, do we have covenant today? Do we have covenant? I will do the covenant. But before that, I want Sister Tin, let us worship. Who will worship? Hallelujah. Come I'm on. Sing the song. Let this.